Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today to learn more about the metaverse. I am Dean Whitaker, CEO and President of Whitaker Associates, your host along with Golden Shovel for today's webinar. Just a reminder to use the chat box at the bottom of the page to ask any questions you may have. We will address them either during the presentation or during the Q&A period at the end. The, the webinar will be recorded and you will be sent a link afterwards. Please welcome Aaron Bouchard, CEO of Golden Shovel, as our featured speaker for today's webinar on the metaverse. Aaron has extensive experience in virtual reality and augmented reality industry, and is a leading expert on the development and implementation of the metaverse. Under his leadership, Golden Shovel has become a pioneer in the field of virtual and augmented reality, pushing the boundaries for what is possible of the world of the metaverse. We are thrilled to have you here today, Aaron, to share your insights and vision for the future of this exciting technology. Welcome, Aaron. Hey, thank you very much, Dean. A real pleasure to be here. Well, sounds good. Well, I'm looking forward to sharing with you guys uh, about the economic development in the metaverse and uh, a real pleasure to be, uh, be here presenting with uh, uh, Dean and the Whitaker Associates who have so much respect for. Um, just uh, so you guys know, this uh, will be recorded and uh, we'll have uh, slides available if anybody would uh, like them afterwards, be able to send them out. And um, with that said, let me uh, share a little bit about the metaverse. Now, I know what you might be thinking, the metaverse is uh, a very, you know, it's been pretty popular recently as far as the term's concerned, but there's a lot of questioning about what it's gonna be all about. And so what I'm gonna share today is um, a little bit about what the metaverse is, first of all, and uh, why it's coming, and we can have confidence in that. And then second, what uh, um, my company, Golden Shovel, which is an economic development communications firm, share a little bit about our journey through virtual reality into the metaverse. And then lastly, um, share a little bit about where it's going and some of the unique aspects of it that you can expect to see going forward. For uh, And uh, particularly talk about uh, our vision for what we believe uh, will be the economic developer's role in the metaverse. So with that said, let me start with this guy right here, uh, Mr. Zuckerberg. Uh, last October, about a, uh, introduced his, changed the entire name of Facebook to Meta. And that's really when metaverse suddenly became on the scene. He had a full hour and a half presentation about his vision for the metaverse. Um, incredibly confident in that that's, going to be the future and uh, but he wasn't the first guy to come up with the word metaverse actually it was uh, this gentleman right here this is neil stevenson uh, back in the 1994 i believe is when he wrote snow crash uh, this was kind of a tongue-in-cheek cyberpunk novel that really put neil on the map and um it talks all about the creation of a of a metaverse and the idea that you can go to a, a place digitally and have a digital avatar and interact with all aspects of society on there and purchase property and the whole likes. Um, if you haven't had a chance to read it, it's interesting. Uh, Neil Stevenson since had 99 wrote a book, Cryptonomicon, which predicted cryptocurrency and most re recently talked about solutions for um, uh, basically uh, solving climate change with his uh, latest books. You could definitely uh, check him out. He's from Ames, Iowa. You may have also seen Ready Player One. Uh, this started as a book and ended up becoming a Spielberg film. Another model of the metaverse, which is the idea that you'd be able to go to, in this case, all these different um, uh, planets. And in each planet, there was a different focus, whether it might be gaming or education. And it was a little bit of a dystopian future, but you'd be able to go in there and uh, interact as a virtual self. But to make it more simpler, as a definition, Metaverse is a virtual reality space in which users can interact with computer-generated environment and other users. So if you think about that, in some ways, um, there's been Metaverses around for some time. You could think of things like whether it's computer gaming, um, games like Fortnite or massive multiplayer games. Uh, there's Roblox. If you have a kid that's 12 or younger, they've most likely been on uh, Roblox, um, has millions of users. 
and it's a place where they can interact with each other and um, in a virtual reality space. Now, my first part here is making a case for why the metaverse is absolutely coming. And this is just a, some of the companies, no longer, this is a little bit dated. Uh, this came from 2021, but this is, so this is nearly the, all of the companies that are actively developing the metaverse. But look at just some of these. We got uh, in the experience area, Meta, Niantic, which made the Pokemon Go game, the Fortnite, Minecraft, Nintendo. Um, they're making experiences and content for the metaverse. Uh, in the discovery area, you got like the Facebook and the Unity and the Steam, Google, they're developing pieces. Um, over in, there's some people working on hardware like Oculus. Uh, the Apple's been working on hardware. PlayStation's coming out with their new version. Vive is another big one. There's all sorts of companies working in that space. And then the infrastructure for hosting and um, uh, basically uh, serving all of this data. There's literally trillions of dollars going into it. And let me give you just an example of some of the companies that are participating. Uh, Disney has, this is from 2022 in January. So this is the beginning of last year. They patented metaverse technology for projecting personalized 3D images into their theme parks, which is certainly gonna be uh, interesting. Um, Nike, which has uh, been using NFTs. Now NFTs, uh, I'll talk briefly about them, but uh, NFT is the ownership arena around the metaverse. So like if you're gonna own something that like say your avatar is gonna have a pair of shoes on, in this case, Nike shoes, uh, you can prove that you own it using what's called an NFT. Um, but already, and this just came out in November uh, this last year, they've made $185 million off selling these. There's a huge market for avatars and people being able to make sure that they present themselves digitally the way that they want in the same day, way that we buy clothing and the like and present ourselves in person. Um, this is a brand new article, came a couple of days ago. This is how the World Economic uh, Forum is going to bring leaders in the metaverse. So there's places to uh, for them to discuss things regarding the future of the planet. Uh, this is really crazy. This is January 16th. So this is really recent. Um, Seoul has launched this metaverse platform for their entire city. So they've made a digital twin, which is a model of their city, put it on the metaverse. And now they're going to be um, adding in government services and the like, where you could go there and handle any of your affairs uh, with the country uh, through the metaverse and your avatar. Um, the big consulting firms are involved with this. I, I had a chance to uh, meet with some people from Deloitte. They had just started just last year uh, the Unlimited Reality, which is a whole division of Deloitte to look into these virtual areas. And um, they've been trying all sorts of different things along that way, but making sure that they can inform their clients on how to participate and be a part of that. Um, if you go onto the Deloitte's page and, and go through Metaverse, they actually have been doing reports on the various countries and cities, uh, determining where they are on the Metaverse and what they're up to. So you could definitely take a look at that, but it's, uh, it's significant. Uh, McKinsey forecasts a $5 trillion Metaverse. And uh, ideas for why getting involved now would be great. And so uh, McKinsey has been involved. Um, I've met with... Uh, a gentleman that was working on uh, uh, metaverse creation that worked for Ernst & Young out of Spain. Um, they used it for training, but this is, uh, this is gonna be some real significant business. Now, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, even though it deserves four different webinars, but there's some various components of the metaverse. On one hand, we have the NFT, which I mentioned. NFT is the contract, if you will, for owning something in the metaverse. So um, NFT has been popular around art uh, over the last uh, year and a half, um, but it could be other things, any kind of ownership so that you know that it's yours. And uh, that, that's what the NFTs does. It uses the blockchain technology. Blockchain is a trust building tool. So what it is is an infallible system for um, showing that, um, a contract has been signed or that a, a currency transaction has been made 
and uh, very powerful technology that um, uses multiple computers so that it's very difficult for anybody to hack. And it shows it ultimately is what's going to build trust in the metaverse for making transactions. There's cryptocurrency, which means like in, in, in some ways, I'm not going to talk about like Bitcoin and those likes, although those are definitely cryptocurrencies and relevant to all of that. But you think about like even something uh, like a game like Fortnite, where if you want to buy something for your character in Fortnite, there has to be some kind of universal currency that's shared so that people can make transactions with a global audience that uses many different countries currencies. And so the, the cryptocurrency plays a role in the metaverse and that there's gotta be a universal currency for um, each metaverse. And then web three ultimately is the decentralization. So opposite of what maybe like Facebook or Twitter, these big social media platforms where everybody goes to one platform and then they gather your data and can do whatever they want with it. The promise of Web3 is that it gets spread out over um, lots of different types of computers that you can control your own information and choose who gets what. And that'll be important also for trust building in the, the metaverse. And we've seen the, some of these big centralized companies like Facebook uh, crack a little bit under the trust issues. Um, Google also, which I think will uh, come around with uh, Web3 to give people more control of their own information. Um, two of the real popular metaverse, and I want to just say right now, there isn't a single metaverse. I propose there's metaverses and that um, there's going to be different styles, your, um, although there is going to be some sort of universal avatar, it might be presented a little differently in different metaverses. And each and the metaverses are going to have different um, focuses and aspects. There might be some big universal ones that are that cover a lot of different categories, um, but there's going to be different ones that you'll be able to, to join. And um, two of the big popular ones that are decentralized, just like the Web3 discussion, is the Sandbox and Decentraland. Um, both of these have their own cryptocurrencies for making uh, exchanges inside of them. They have uh, large user bases and uh, you can access them. Uh, the Sandbox came out just a little bit pixelated as you can see in the, the photo there. Um, that is uh, really focused on experiential um, environments, games, that you can play and you can like set up a game, for example, in Sandbox and then somebody could buy uh, a ticket to go experience that, that game that you built. Uh, Decentraland has been really focused on um, events and it's had everything from Samsung and Tesla is there all the way to Snoop Dogg is there and they'll throw these big events. Heineken had a huge event where they uh, uh, had launched a product out of there. And then what you can do is you can go into Decentraland and they can go attend those. And uh, it's another way to connect with their fans and customers. But ultimately the goal of the metaverse as a whole is to bring people closer together. And the promise of the metaverse and the VR experience particularly is this feeling of presence when you're completely um, brought into an immersive experience where you can, your brain can't see anything other than the, the digital world that it's in. It has this little trick of the brain and it makes you feel like you're there. And uh, um, with the combination of 3D sound and um, other aspects that makes this real close sense of presence, which you don't get over say Zoom, like we're doing now, where the, the sound's just coming out of your computer or, or otherwise. And so it's, uh, this is the big promise is that we're gonna be able to do the same things we do as humans without all of the, the cost of travel and all of the cost of uh, um, time that it takes to be able to connect, especially if we're not near each other. So Golden Shovel, we started this journey in VR, which uh, and the metaverse back in 2017. Uh, this is a photo from September 2017. And uh, we had made our first familiarization tour for economic developers and brought it to the International Economic Development Council's uh, annual meeting in Toronto. And uh, Greg Wassmansdorf from Newmark worked with us on this and 
gave us advice along with other site consultants on what they like to see when they're on their FAM tours. And so uh, um, a lot of these FAM tours, you know, they're covering, um, you know, what your community is like from a business centric perspective. So what are the businesses that are a good fit for the region? What are the um, uh, schools like and the, the workforce development programs? What are the neighborhoods like? What is the healthcare like? And then really going all the way down to what's the nightlife like and what do you, uh, where can you go shopping and what is the uh, other extracurricular stuff you can do and, and, you know, kayaking and mountain biking and things of that. So we put together these tours. It's the same ones that economic development groups now are paying really big dollars to bring in site consultants just to check out so that they'll have them in top of mind when a business opportunity arises. The only difference is we can make them in VR with this feeling like you're standing in those spots, visiting those sites and uh, uh, do it in a way. So this uh, headset that he has on, this is actually from a PlayStation, uh, PlayStation 4, which was at the time, back in 2017, the best option. Uh, we had those or else you had your cell phone being put into a little box, like a cardboard box. And uh, it was it had a lot of potential. Uh, this was great, but it was an awful lot of wires connected and cameras. You can even see that little camera behind Greg. And um, uh, things have come a long way. Uh, more, most recently, the Quest 2 is, I'd say, by far the most popular headset. Uh, these headsets are much more portable. They're literally a, a headset and two controllers, and so you can put them in your backpack now and take them with you. You can put all of your tours onto them and uh, take them to, to trade shows and the like. And that's um, initially when we started, we really focused on that aspect of economic development. Like, what do you do if you're trying to attract an aerospace company and you're in Eastern Kentucky, but you're out in France and you're at their big aerospace convention and industry show? Um, how do you show them what that's like? I mean, you can bring out a brochure, you could show a video at your booth, but wouldn't it be better if you could actually show them the sites that are available and show them what it's like to visit that region in a way where it feels like you're there? And that's what was really the promise of the, the VR technology. Um, more so today, we're focused even more on the workforce attraction, talent attraction, I'd say even career exploration. And I'll show you a little bit more of that. And of course, tourism. Tourism is a real natural fit because um, you get that feeling of being there before you go to visit. And, you know, as far as the VR is concerned, we don't have any illusions that someone's going to move their job or their family without visiting a place in person. However, this technology can really get you excited about a place and ultimately uh, influence that decision to go there and visit and then bring uh, that business or family with you. Uh, this is on the left, our executive producer, this Greg Colby Ornson. Um, he's a uh, uh, head of a longtime veteran of video work and has been working with us for now for six years doing this VR work. And um, here he is on top, happens to be on top of a water tower. He said it was the scariest shoot that he'd ever done. This is in York County, Nebraska. Uh, perhaps surprising, um, you'd maybe think that the New Yorks and San Francisco's would be the first to do this kind of, uh, take advantage of this kind of new technology. But the truth is, it's been the rural communities that adopted it first. And the reason is because they have the hardest time getting site consultants to come visit. Um, you know, even, even like talking to some of these site consultants, they're like, yeah, we'll be happy to go to Portland, but we're not going to go to Wichita. Um, you can't pay them to come. They don't have the time. They're too busy uh, cruising around, representing companies or doing these fam tours. And they're not going to... Um, they're not going to have an even opportunity to see the most rural communities because they don't have the time to go there. And so that left open the question, well, how do you bring your community to somebody so that they can have a good first impression? And that's where the VR really comes into play. Um, I also want to note that uh, the camera that Greg is holding here was the first camera we used, which was called the Omni Rig. It actually consisted of six GoPro cameras that were all bolted together in a, in a, sphere. And then once you shot all those videos at the exact same time, then you'd have to stitch them together into a, to a big sphere. Um, on the right, this is just a few years later, this camera takes all of the 360 video, stitches it together inside the camera, 
and also has um, stabilization and stuff of that nature. Those that look, we have it connected right to a boat. It's a waterproof of all things. And just in a few years, the technology just for the cost of what one of those GoPros on the left cost, um, we could get for the one on the right. And I noted the uh, currently when we make these videos, these 360 videos, we're either putting them on websites, uh, you can view them in the, the headsets, which is by far the best experience, but there's other ways to, to look at them also by dragging your cursor around. Um, with that note, uh, the real immersive experience requires a headset, because if you're sitting in your office watching a video, your brain knows clearly that you're in your office and doesn't take on the same kind of intensity of, of um, the memory retention and the experience that you get uh, when you're fully immersed. And on the right, uh, this is uh, York County. They brought their um, headset to one of their industry egg shows to show it to a site consultant. So kind of get a sense of how it could be used. And it just works really, really well, especially when you're in person with somebody to be able to show them. Um, one of the areas that we've had a lot of success with this technology is in site promotion because um, so many of the brownfield and greenfield sites that um, economic developers are, are looking to market are literally covered with soybeans or corn or something of the sort. And how do you show them the vision that you have for your community? And this is where um, with the VR, we can put in 3D models to show those visions and make them part of the overall experience. And so this one was in um, Nebraska, and this was actually a engineering model from Olson. And in it, it started with, uh, you're standing there, you're looking at the soybeans and this building pops out of the ground. It turns into a full crisp resolution image. We even had train in the background. Uh, here's some other examples from some other states we work in. Uh, to date, we've done probably 80 projects around the country in VR where they're using them for these purposes um, or else uh, fam tours and career exploration work. There's another one, Troutwood Medical Group. Uh, here's another Greenfield site available. I think this one was in Arkansas. And then if we have an existing facility, we we'll use a technology like Matterport. And let me see, huh? I think a, would actually be to pull it up. So let me screensaver. Okay. Here's an example of Matterport. Now, this is a very specialized camera that um, how it works is you go through a facility and every eight to 10 feet, you take another 360 photo. Uh, the technology that's captured in here will add, connect all those photos together into a giant 3D model, which is called the, the dollhouse view. So that's what we're looking at here. This is a 3D model. This happens to be in uh, Eastern Kentucky. And once I go inside the building, I can literally walk around the building, the entire facility. And if I'm overseas or, or, and can't be there in person, it's even more detailed because I can do some measurements and to say I wanted to see um, how big this space was going to be. It just looks like it's nine foot wide, six feet up, and I can just determine if a piece of equipment or something would work that I might need to put in that space. Um, this is incredibly accurate technology, and I have my own uh, personal case study on it And that I recently moved from California to Minnesota, back to uh, be a little closer to family. And uh, when we moved, we, it was kind of, it was during COVID, it was a little tricky to travel, and we found a place that happened to have a Matterport tour, so we could tour the whole place, and I could, you can put on a VR headset and walk through a building as if you were walking through it, and um, I was able to purchase a home uh, solely through that experience. And that's really the goal with uh, commercial real estate too, that um, I mean, somebody's still gonna ultimately visit. This might be the thing that, to, that um, you know, kind of puts you over the hump and gets them to come check out your particular facility.
And then um, another thing that we've been focusing on more recently is like thinking about this. This is just from December 7th, this last year from the World Economic Forum about how could the metaverse impact education? And, um, you know, when we started, Golden Shovel is 12 years old now, and we used to do all business attraction. It was so focused on that, finding those big wins and you have the people come move. And then sometime in the last like five years, it really transitioned to workforce attraction. So suddenly it was like, how do you get the people to come there so that the businesses can then go and know that there's going to be talent available to them? And that's been a, a massive focus for the company. We've done so many uh, websites and success stories around that. But frankly, the talent wars have just begun. And we're going to be, I think, all across the country. And right now, we must work with 200 organizations in North America. Um, we're seeing in every single community, rural or metro, that there is a shortage of talent, um, particularly in key skills uh, like welding and a whole variety of them. And so we're really looking at how do you introduce those jobs to the people that are already living in your community, particularly students and uh, people looking for new careers, making sure that underserved communities are getting uh, exposure to these potential jobs just for the sake of business retention and expansion. And so one of the projects we did was up in uh, Eastern Kentucky with uh, Shelby County, and they had us make five VR videos of their leading employers. We did tours of the plants and, it's, and then we brought them, ended up bringing them to the high schools and job fairs. And uh, they called us after the first week and said, hey, we need 10 more headsets. And we're like, what? 10 more headsets? What are you doing over there? They're like, well, we brought them to these job fairs. And there's a big line at our booth because their students are so excited to try the tech, not just the technology, but they get us get this experience of being on the plant floor of these businesses that oftentimes they drove by every single day and had no idea that how they were connected to um, the United States as a whole or the, the, the various things that they were exporting. And frankly, students think that manufacturing is the same way it was back in Henry Ford's days. It's going to be hard and it's dirty. And that's just not the case. The, the advanced manufacturing is clean and high tech. And how do you show that to them? And it's logistically really hard to get a busload of students to your plant, especially if there's limitations around um, safety, getting them on the floor or other reasons that uh, just the cost of getting a bunch of students out of school for a day to get them over to your facility. So why not bring your business to the schools and give students an experience and the ones that are really interested um, can then you know, be, be brought on to the next steps and to be able to check out your place as a whole. And I think that uh, this is gonna be part of every economic developer's toolkit over the next uh, five years and, and further because um, the talent wars have just begun. And unfortunately, I believe it's going to get much worse before it gets better. Um, so this was really exciting. And so now we've been focusing a lot on our the VR side about uh, making it available to uh, students to be able to experience these. Uh, here's a couple of just clips. I'm not going to pull up a whole video, but you can see some of the shots from these. And what's really neat about the career exploration videos of leading employers a couple of different angles. One is that you can actually meet the people that are doing the jobs and loving them. So you can see somebody uh, who's like, you know, it's like, I do this. I don't believe I got this job. You know, a couple of years ago, I was trying to figure out something to do. And now I did, I'm doing this and it's just awesome. And I, I have a career and benefits and, um, you know, I'm loving life. Or uh, we've even seen this type of technology being brought to like correctional facilities where, there's career tracks and correctional facilities to learn some of these in-demand jobs that leading employers need so bad. And it's so cool to see somebody like right now, for example, if you're in a correctional facility, you could get hundred thousand dollar job offer before you are even out because the jobs are in that much demand and whatever is being, whatever career tracks are being trained in those facilities. It's really cool to use the VR to show them what it might be like to, to meet somebody uh, who has already uh, gone through that path and is thriving 
to tell them about what they uh, they love about it. And frankly, the underserved communities where they're not exposed to certain types of career paths is going to be a big focus because we're going to need all of those people people trained in and, and helping out um, when it comes to making sure that the businesses that matter most to our communities are there and can, can grow and expand. Um, otherwise, they're not going to have any options. If you don't have the talent, you can't have the business. And that's the, that's the new norm for uh, economic developers. And so one thing we did, so we've since been talking about metaverses. Let me uh, stop sharing this for a second. I'm going to show you something else. We built an app. So that's one thing to like bring a headset to a place and be like, hey, check this out. Here's a 360 video of being in our community or being in our particular establishment. But what if they're not there in person? So if multiple people have VR headsets, they can actually meet together in a virtual space. And we built a app we call uh, Place VR Meetings. I'll give you a little demo of it. This very much leads into the end of this presentation where I talk about our vision for what is possible for economic developers in the metaverse. So once again, metaverse being a virtual space where people can interact with each other. Um, our vision is the idea of like taking a fam tour. So if a site consultant's coming to take a fam tour from your community, first thing they're gonna do is go to your office and then they're gonna go to you go to your office building and then go to your place. And then inside that spot, what our piece was, we have a virtual conference table. Uh, here's four colleagues of mine. Uh, they might have their company logo on the, the chest of their avatar. They'd have their face uh, in there. It's like, it's not, it doesn't have to be you, but it's nice for it to be uniquely you in the, in the sense. And uh, it's all in 3D sound. You can talk to each other and it sounds like they're right across the table from you or right to your left, or right to your right. And that really influences the feeling of presence. And in this case, I'm pulling up a video. This is a old mine in Eastern Kentucky. It's a site that's available with short rail access. And so you can see it was just a gravel pit. And now we have a advanced manufacturing place that just popped out of the ground. Um, all of my colleagues are still in here with me, checking it out. I'm talking about it and pointing things out. The, the hands can point and wave and all the like. That train in the back is real. <laughs> that, that train's real. Um, but this one, the other train uh, with the blue front, that is actually a 3D model along with the building and all of the other vehicles that you see. So we were able, to, they really wanted to highlight this particular rail spur. And so we were able to make that as a 3D model and show the train with the very service that it would be wrapped in on it and show that might work. Um, it's really cool to combine the I was talking earlier about the 360 videos and that feeling of being there and then seeing a 3D building pop out of the ground. You'd be looking at the soybeans under your feet and suddenly there's pavement of a parking lot. It's, uh, it's pretty cool. Um, along with being able to bring people to the actual site and show it to them or bring them through a fam tour, we wanted to include the rest of the things into our app that would allow for a full meeting. So. Um, whether it be a slideshow in this case, kind of your classic PowerPoint or PDF file, um, to be able to pull that up and have all the data that's relating to your particular site after they got to see it for themselves. Uh, we can pull out 3D models, whether it be the, the model we put on the site, or in this case, it's an extraction out of Google Earth of, that particular, of a particular site. So you could pull that up and point at it. Then also, since it's a virtual conference table and we are in a virtual world, we can change the location of where that is. So that could be literally right on the site where you're talking about. You could have your meeting there and uh, it's always warmer and always sunny than sometimes it is uh, certainly in Minnesota. Right now it's really cold and not sunny. Um, so it's a cool way to, to be able to have meetings and, and showcase your community virtually. And with that said, I get to say goodbye to all of you. So see you later. Thanks, Aaron. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna go back to my other. Uh...
other slideshows. So that's a little example of the, the VR app. Um, we've been working on this for quite some time. I got an opportunity to present what we're doing in economic development at the Metaverse Global Congress, which was in um, San Jose, California last June. And that was absolutely amazing. I mean, first of all, since I usually speak with economic developers, it was really neat to be able to um, talk about this from a perspective where they didn't know what economic development really was. And I could talk about what our use case was, but the people working on this was so broad. It was everything from like Heineken beer to the Mayo Clinic talking about using the metaverse to deal with brain cancer, be able to walk in with VR and look at something like a tumor. Um, it talked all, there were groups like tons of people from the fashion industry that were talking about how to, to connect um, avatars with new fashions and believe it or not there was just a announcement recently where Burberry did a whole uh, whole thing with Minecraft where they were making clothing that was Minecraft influenced because Minecraft's a significant metaverse right now and um, they're able to uh, uh, make products that they think are going to resonate with starting with Gen Z and putting it on their avatars and eventually you'll buy those products in person. So a few things about the metaverse coming up. Now, the first thing is you, in order to interact with the metaverse, you have to have an avatar. You're a, a digital version of yourself. And there's been some different approaches to this. Uh, this one's called Ready Player Me. This is one of the companies that started making a universal avatar system where you could make your avatar. And then the idea would be that you could use it in multiple metaverses in different scenarios. Um, here's one through spatial where you can go in and have meetings. Uh, this one, it takes a photo of your face, kind of wraps it around a, um, a avatar and then gives you a body, with the black t-shirt and the like, you can dress up your guy, but you can walk around and be yourself. It's pretty realistic looking. Um, it has a little video up above it of my actual self on webcam, but that's kind of a new approach. Um, in this case, over on the left, here's a relatively realistic avatar. This was from San Diego. The chamber set up a spot for them to be able to meet virtually. And that was one of the first chambers we'd seen doing something with a VR space. Over on the right, uh, this gentleman is the head of the Silicon Valley Virtual Reality Meetup Group out in uh, Silicon Valley. And uh, his avatar, he's standing next to it on a full-size screen and I was able to interact with uh, both him and live person, but also his colleague wearing his avatar skin. And uh, that avatar was shot with 150 cameras in a booth. And it ends up making a duplicate of yourself. And it looked exactly like him. Um, although currently uh, there's been a lot of the, the gamification and the fact that it's hard to get really realistic looks. Uh, there's been some funny things where people are laughing at the, avatars that are coming out, uh, particularly a spotlight on, on Meta. But I don't want to fool you like there isn't more realistic stuff coming along. And let me show you this really quick video. Up, down, but also the nonverbal cues that we rely on to communicate with each other and understand tone. Things like raising an eyebrow, squinting, uh, widening my eyes, or scrunching my nose. You know, these avatars are way better at capturing those subtleties that define physical interactions. They're just much more natural. And being able to control the lighting on the avatars adds another dimension of life to them. When we move the light around, you can see how it interacts with my hair, it reflects on my skin, and you can even see it in my eyes. Now, these are awesome, but they also take a really long time to generate. So we're working on something that's a lot quicker for people to use. So it just gives you an example, like right now, the technology is not allowing to stream this kind of quality, but it's completely coming. There'll be digital twins of yourself. I like to think they'll be slightly better looking versions of ourselves, but uh, um, this stuff is completely in right development. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, just recently, MetaQuest Pro came out last October. Um, this is an expensive headset. It's about $1,500, uh, but it also tracks your mouth. It tracks your pupils. So when you're in metaverse and talking and smiling and you can see if someone's looking at you or not, which wasn't possible before. So the technology is existing. And I saw this interesting article um, back in September from uh, the entrepreneur 
And uh, in this article, the, the um, author was saying, I call them Generation W, which means double U, and it's because from the moment they're born, they'll have a double identity, one physical and one digital. And I think this is, you know, as far out as the sounds watching this webinar right now about us being uh, avatars and doing real life business in the metaverse, there's going to be a generation of us growing up where in their entire life they have a digital twin of themselves that they use to conduct all sorts of business and fun and entertainment and government relations all through their double identity. And um, I think it's uh, um, for all of us, we've all experienced this in one way or another. Uh, I grew up, I'm a exennial, so I grew up without any internet up until when I started my first job, 97. So that was uh, when the uh, kind of first graphics were coming on the internet. So my entire, like, I saw that exist, but everybody generational after me, um, it always existed. Like they never experienced not having the internet. And now Gen Z never experienced not having social media or not having smartphones or iPads. And that's just, uh, it's crazy to think about, but there's going to be a generation W where they don't know any better other than having two different identities to represent them. And the future is uh, going to require a lot of time of people in the metaverse to be able to do stuff. There's going to be an awful lot of jobs. I get a chance to talk to high schools and junior highs about this technology. And it's so fun to talk to junior high kids because I can say um, with much honesty that like today I'm showing you what I'm doing with my business. But know that when I was in junior high, not a single thing that I'm doing today existed. All of that. You know, if you're looking for your career path in junior high, just know that most of the career paths aren't, don't exist yet. And that includes with all sorts of jobs that are going to be available in the metaverse. And uh, don't tell your parents, but um, being good at video games actually could have a huge impact on your ability to interact uh, naturally in the metaverse, just to, uh, getting used to controllers and the screens and all of that. So kind of a funny twist. Um, the, it's not without its... Uh, challenges. One of the big challenges that we've had as a company, and I, I thought it would happen faster, is that the headsets haven't been uh, adopted as quickly as possible, which initially the thought was like, okay, well, if, if everybody has headsets, great. You know, if we're going to have a VR meeting and we're all going to go in there and have a discussion, well, we need five headsets for five people to be in there and they'd have to have their own and have our app. But um, we thought we could get around that by sending those headsets over to people and, and having them use them, but it's been technically challenging because as soon as someone gets a headset, then you got to like show them how to use it. And if they haven't experienced one before and make sure it's charged up and they're connected to the internet and they have access to the app. And it's been um, logistically more difficult than I had expected, I guess, when we had started. But well, we've had huge success where we can have them in person, like the career exploration videos. You could bring them to a place or bring them to an industry show and show them your community. That works fantastic. And for people that have their own headsets, um, it works really, really well too, but it's been a slow adoption. So Quest sold almost 50 million units, which sounds like an awful lot, but with 8 billion people on the planet, um, it's still a drop in the bucket. And uh, Apple's coming out with some, uh, we've seen stuff from Vive, we're gonna see stuff from Samsung. Uh, every day there's, um, products just with this recent CES, there's been some really new technology uh, that's coming to support this. And the other thing I think has been challenging for the metaverse is that uh, right now, especially the experience is very, it has this gamified feel like they're the characters so that it can be in, in real time uh, isn't quite the full resolution, realistic avatar like I showed you of Mark earlier. Um, they're more gamified. And that doesn't seem so unnatural for um, younger generations, but for older generations, and particularly I found internationally, we do some work with some countries in Africa and it's very business for, you know, it's a suit and tie and you're doing business and it's a, it's a leap for um, older professionals, especially to think like, how am I gonna be this animated guy and still do serious business? You know, and so that's one of the transitions that's happening now. That's not an issue for everyone, but it's an issue for uh, people that have been used to doing uh, business a certain way. 
And so that's going to um, take both an increase of the technology to make stuff more realistic, as well as um, probably a generation or two to, to really um, live in this space. Uh, but I think where the real exciting stuff's coming up is in the augmented reality. And this is a screenshot from that, uh, the show uh, Kingsman, where they put on the glasses and there's a, one, one guy, you can kind of see him over on the right. You know, he's the real guy sitting at the table. Everybody else is a virtual avatar. But you're going to be able to um, interact with our peers. Once again, back to the beginning was, hey, uh, the ultimate goal of all of this is to bring us closer together and feel like we're there and present with each other. And we're going to be able to do your meditation sessions or yoga sessions with uh, your friend. And they're going to feel like they're right there next to you. And that's the, that's the promise of the augmented reality. Augmented reality being that uh, you're introducing digital stuff on top of what you're seeing in, in reality. And uh, this isn't as sci-fi as it looks. I mean, these things are coming out right now. This, this is from late November. Um, AR glasses being brought up by this company is called Inmo. Uh, you'll be able to see graphics and visuals through your glasses. And uh, they use a ring to do the navigation. And here's some examples of keyboards, uh, interfaces where your screen gets projected, uh, driving in the bottom right, where you might be walking or driving along and it gives you directions right in front of your face. Um, various meetings. I mean, this is going to be really cool stuff. You better go meet somebody and have their LinkedIn icon show up above their head so you can get all their contact information. You'll never forget someone's name again. Which leads us to my kind of final piece of this presentation, which is like, what is economic development in the metaverse going to look like? And, and what I think it's going to look like is going to be a um, like a skyscraper type of approach where um, the metaverse will be a, a large building and all communities will have a office in that building, just like you have an office in a building now in your own community. And you'll be able to go there, you'll be able to uh, find the, the community you want to visit. Um, there might be other things going on, like maybe there'll be speakers in an event space or a, a, a place where there's booths and, and people being able to share about their communities. But um, ultimately, you go to their office and in your office, there you'd be a virtual avatar and you'd have all of the different tools, just like you have a website today, you're going to have a virtual office and it'll have your 360 fam tours and it's going to have your site tours and it'll have all of the maps and models and all the information you need to showcase your community virtually. And that's gonna really reduce a lot on travel time. It's gonna reduce a lot on the costs because especially smaller and mid-sized communities don't have huge budgets. And so they really need to uh, be creative with how they use them. And uh, making these kind of tours is a really effective way of doing that because if you can't, you're either gonna pay for somebody to come visit and if you can't pay for that one person to visit, you can make a tour for about the same price, bring it to all sorts of people. And when you have to go out there and promote and sell the places that you live in. And so really excited about this. Um, the metaverse is new. And uh, as far as Golden Shovel is concerned, uh, we are going to participate one way or another in the advancement of this technology. And, and we've uh, pioneered the VR side but the metaverse carries so much promise for communities. Um, once again, especially for communities that have trouble getting people to come visit. Uh, we've done work in Haiti, done work in uh, Western Africa, both in some islands in the Caribbean, all of which are incredibly difficult to get people to come visit in person. So if you're gonna do economic development, how do you go about really showcasing those places? And that's the, that's the promise of the metaverse. And just to kind of put this in your mind, this is from November 17th, 2022. Uh, there's this particular country, it's called the, the Pacific Nation of Tuvalu, and they are pretty sure their country is going to be underwater due to uh, ocean rise. And um, they are putting their entire country in the metaverse, and they're trying to preserve a digital twin of what they have now. And their government and the, the citizens and all of that, once the island is underwater, may only exist in the metaverse. And it's a, just a really interesting and exciting um, potential for, for preserving uh, cultures, history, knowledge, and uh, 
once again, keeping people close together, particularly when there is no place to be close together in. And so, with that said, I say thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be able to present uh, with you, Dean, and, um, and to everybody that was attending today. And I'm open to taking a few questions. Well, while we wait uh, for those people to enter their questions in the chat box, I did come up with a few. And it's kind of a, a broader question, but how will the metaverse impact society and daily life in the future? What are, what are some of the other areas that you see, like for you, your son, who you mentioned was eight years old, how will, how will the metaverse be impacting him? Well, I'm going <laughs> to, well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know for sure, which is probably the smart answer. Um, but on the, on the other side, I, you know, there's two, two ways to look at it. One is this the, a fear-based approach which is gonna be that it's gonna be super dystopian and we're not gonna to talk to each other and we're all gonna be locked in our own rooms. And the only way we're gonna connect is digitally through the metaverse. Um, and I, I, sure that makes for some good uh, novels, but I don't think that to be uh, the, the actual reality. I am very optimistic about how it's going to be presented in the future and what it is gonna do. I mean, imagine like going to the bank, for example and uh, putting on your VR headset and being able to go and actually talk to somebody that's there just like you would going in person without the, it's not gonna be without people, I guess, unlike some of the uh, digital tools that have come out versus um, through the web two, where a lot of this stuff can be done online. It, it's usually void of actual people. Whereas the metaverse is all about people. It's all about connecting people and having access to all of the stuff that you can engage with others. And so um, I, uh, I see a lot of promise for it. I, I think that we'll be able to uh, particularly see our families, friends and loved ones uh, closer and be able to do more stuff with them together than we're able to do, um, particularly with how mobile populations are right now around the country and the world. My wife is a substitute school teacher at the moment. I'm wondering about metaverse and how it's gonna impact education and how that how will that look in the future as we we uh, maybe we go to a, a metaverse school rather than a physical school? Um, I th I think there's huge promise for education, uh, and for a bunch of reasons. Uh, but one of them is the quality of teachers. Um, I mean, I there's a lot of different types of schools, school districts. There's different types of programs around the world, uh, even at the university level. And, um, and to be able to participate with the top quality educators in a way, if you can't be there in person, still to be engaged and have access to those, I think we'll share that. It's just gonna be, a, it's gonna be strong for, for all those that are looking to be educated. Um, and it's funny, cause even like, you know, in an avatar situation, you can, some avatars look kind of crazy and the like, or you might have a crazy name <laughs> instead of uh, your actual name. Uh, in the in the book and movie uh, Ready Player One, there's a a planet, which is how they kind of just each metaverse is a planet, and they had one that's totally dedicated to school, and people would go to school in VR. But in there, you can't have a crazy name, and you can't have a crazy avatar. You have to be yourself, and you have to have a uh, a person like there's restrictions placed around the educational to control some of that so it's not so chaotic and really focuses it in on learning whereas you can go to a different metaverse to do the the gaming or, or other activities and so um i have a i have a huge hopes the other, the other thing that i think is really going to be beneficial to education outside of the uh, metaverse as a whole is just the vr experience being able to bring people into other types of companies to different locations I mean, what a powerful teaching tool to be talking about a place um, or a type of career or whatever, but then be able to actually bring the students to the, to that location in a way where it feels like they're visiting. Well, I've got two more questions. Um, one was uh, about artificial intelligence and the role it plays in the metaverse. And right now we're all kind of, at least I've been going down this rabbit hole called Chad GBT and it kind of absorbs my life the other day and looked up and two hours had gone by. 
I just kind of wonder what role will artificial intelligence play inside the metaverse? I think it's going to have a massive role inside the metaverse and for a handful of reasons. Ironically, I just watched an hour and a half interview with the CEO of ChatGBT this morning. And um, it's uh, that technology is, is unlike anything we've seen before. It's likely to become an next trillion dollar company and industry is going to be around AI. But AI plays a huge role in the metaverse and for a couple of reasons. I mean, not just in the the chat and interactive ability so that you could have an a avatar that's not without a human behind it that mm. could have full conversations with you representing or you could have a 24-hour person at your economic development office in the metaverse ready to answer any questions loaded with all the data about your community so when people come they could do that and then they could be like hey you know you really should talk to so and so who's a a uh, real person <laughs> and, and could uh, could set up those meetings for you so that you know that you got a legitimate prospect um, that's going to save valuable time and, and workforce. Um, but on the on the flip side, I think also um, you think about things like Dolly, where mm -hmm. does image generation uh, now they're soon we're going to see video generation. You can see uh, music generation, like where there's other types of things being made at the same time, I think there's gonna be a role um, from that type of AI to help create the experiences and customize them to the interests of the people. So when they come to your uh, office to learn more about your community, it is tailored to their interests, whether it might be the workforce or business attraction or, or looking for locations and sites. So if you were starting your company over again, today, what would you do? Um, oh, that's a really good question. <laughs> I never quite thought about that. I kind of think of like I'm starting over at the company every day anyway. <laughs> it feels that way. Yeah, you know, it's kind of the same reason. Like we started our company in 2009, but we didn't start the VR till 2017. And we certainly are, are exploring the AI capabilities now. I think um, uh, the most exciting thing about owning a business and, and using a business as a vehicle for innovation is it seems the best and most creative approach to be able to develop and bring new products that actually benefit people. And if I started today, I would look at the uh, areas and that have no track record where it's truly the wild west. And right now that's in the, the VR, the metaverse and the AI. And um, there are no courses to to take that are going to guide you on what exactly to do because it's being created literally on the spot. And then I'd focus in on a specific industry, just like um, we do with economic development and try to figure out how to make those tools work the best for, for the people we want to serve. And um, that's what we do now. Uh, I think the biggest difference is if I started it today, I'd start with uh, the latest and newest stuff and uh, um, instead of just adopting it as it comes along. Very interesting because you, you skip over all those investments that you made in the past. Um, when we moved recently, my I had 30 years worth of technology in our basement. So I had the first generation of everything. Um, what do you do with your technology as you move on to the next version of it? We just move on. Um, <laughs> let me tell you, Dean. Oh, okay. So just uh, just to recap on, you know, I mentioned the uh, we had the back when we first started the VR, they had the PlayStation headsets and they had the phones you could put in the, the cardboard boxes. And that was like, show it all the opportunity without the practicality didn't work as well. As soon as a phone <laughs> ran out of power, or I used to say there's like, there's as many technical difficulties as there were phones. <laughs> um, but then suddenly the Oculus Go came out and that was reasonable price point. It was 200 bucks for a headset. It was portable. You could put it in a backpack. You didn't need a little briefcase to haul your PlayStation 4 around. You didn't have to wire it all up. It was instantly, you could just pull it out and show somebody your, your community. That was a huge deal for us. And that's when we started building our VR app. Because we're like, this is great. Now we can build something where people could give their tours live i'm doing rabbit ears with my fingers but you know live in person go through that video of your vr of your fam tour and, and talk about it and make it more relevant to the person you're presenting to so we worked on it for a year and a half and the week that we launched it was in august 
And that same week, Oculus announced they discontinued the headset. Whoa, yikes. And we were like, oh man, <laughs> this is really bad. They're like, good news. There was a new one coming out in six weeks. We had six weeks of limbo um, waiting for the new headset to come out. And as soon as we got our hands on it, then we started developing for the Quest 2. And that took another year. Um, granted, it was ultimately a way better product because the, the uh, Oculus Go's had as many, they had tons of technical difficulties too. Like if you had a meeting longer than 45 minutes, you'd better be holding an ice pack on the front of the headset. Otherwise it was going <laughs> to overheat. Um, the Quest 2, on the other hand, is um, very high resolution, uh, multi-hour battery life, and great uh, um, processing power, so you could really have a meaningful meeting. Plus, you got two hands, so you could feel more like a human. Besides tracking you or following you on social media, how, how should our audience kind of try to keep up with the changes that are going on in the technology? It seems like traveling at the speed of light at the moment. Yeah, it really is. I don't think it's going to slow down um, at all. <laughs> um, for us, um, it might be, I mean, it's it's really about focusing in on the various news channels. Uh, there's various um, kind of groups and blogs that you can be a part of. Uh, we just target in on specific topics, particularly through news feeds, and we're reading multiple articles on uh, the metaverse and VR and, and AR uh, every single day. And inside the company that we actually have people dedicated to doing that research and sharing it with other people across the company so that everybody's up to speed with the changes that are going on. Wow, very interesting. Well, I really appreciate it. I don't see any more questions in the chat um, box. And uh, so I'd like to do a little bit of a wrap up. Um, part of which is to say thank you for joining us today to our participants uh, who came to learn a little bit more about this exciting technology that you shared with us. And I also want to thank you, Aaron. You've been a friend for a long time, and you're my go-to person whenever I want to get a glimpse of what the future looks like and uh, how that is going to impact all of us. So thank you for sharing your vision of the road ahead. And actually, you're the one building the road. So we appreciate all that you've invested in, in being able to do that. And you know, when you do a webinar like this, there's always some behind the scenes people that, that make it make us look good. And so I wanna thank also to Victor Perez, who's been our technical support for this webinar, along with your communication department at Golden Shovel. They've been great in helping get us word out. And last but not least, I wanna thank my colleague, Jamie Gibson for her help in promoting the webinar. Thank you again, Aaron, for for sharing with us your your view of the of what's down the road. and. I wish our participants to enjoy the rest of their day. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. And if anybody would like uh, have any other further questions, uh, feel free to contact me with the information on the screen. So uh, it's been a real pleasure. Thanks, Aaron.